Welcome to the Bonsai Mirai YouTube channel, where we educate you on how to do bonsai better and inspire you through creative projects that expand your awareness of the art form. Click subscribe to be the first to know when new videos are added to the channel. What's going on everybody? Hey, Super Tuesday. And boy, do we have something special for you tonight. Yes, indeed, the Rocky Mountain Bonsai Society, one of the groups of people that I obviously identify with based on being Colorado, born and raised. Uh, my heart lies in the Rockies. And <clears throat> Harold Sasaki, one of, the, one of the really, I think, groundbreaking pioneers in the Rocky Mountain Bonsai Society, was a, a, a massive mentor of mine. Anyways, the Rocky Mountain Bonsai Society reached out to us and they said, hey, can we contribute to a stream to make that stream publicly available so that uh, the public has the ability to see an impressive piece of work on a Rocky Mountain native species. And we said, absolutely, absolutely, we would love to do that. And not only did we want to do it, we wanted to do something very special and of the level uh, that I think represents that monumental mountain range, the great state of Colorado, and a tremendous club in terms of an organization and individuals that I love and cherish. So we're super excited tonight uh, to be doing this stream in collaboration and with the support of the Rocky Mountain Boneside Society who is making all of this possible. Thank you so much, Tom and your team. I got Diana on the mic this evening. Hey everyone. And uh, Josh producing a live stream from the mothership. He's in the house, Lonnie and Jesus on the detail cams. <laughs> and let's rock and roll. Thank you again to the Rocky Mountain Bonsai Society. Let's do this. Okay, so Rocky Mountain Juniper, Juniper Escopulorum. I feel like as far as iconic Rocky Mountain species, Juniper Escopulorum, one at the top of the list, we've got Ponderosa Pine, we've got Limber Pine, we've got Douglas Fir, we've got Engelman and Colorado Spruce. Somewhere in there, the Rocky Mountain Juniper really does occupy a wonderfully beautiful niche inside of that environment. Now, I'm, I can't go 360, but I do want to show you the dimension of this piece. And this piece is a monstrosity of a piece. I like the scale of it. Let me show you the back of the stone. It has a really interesting kind of outward curving lip that embraces the flow of the tree. And this piece, originally this stone was going to be a bridge piece that was going to hold uh, a forest on the top side of this. When we repotted this tree, this has been a piece of material collected by Randy Knight out of the Rockies. Um, and it was a piece of material that had so much potential here. And it was really a matter of how do we utilize that material to the best of its capacity to be the most powerful representation of a natural tree. Because, and let me just sort of talk through this here. We recognize, hey, if I want to create, if I wanted to domesticate this to a degree, and that's not to say that, that domesticating a piece of wild material is a negative, but if I wanted to domesticate this tree to a degree, all branches would come down, we'd have a beautiful green mass here, we'd drop this branch down in here, we'd have several layers, we'd bring some of these over into this negative space, and we would have a very traditional sort of repetitious golden rule form of proportions that really does accentuate that bonsai model in the Japanese form. But the problem is the base, the trunk features, the way that this tree engages with the viewer to maximize its characteristics as a bonsai does not necessarily allow us to put this into a traditional container. In fact, it took a very radical stone to be able to hold this. And the moment that we put it in the stone, it changed everything about the composition and our desire, our efforts, our goals, and our aspirations aesthetically to try and represent this material. And here's where it went. It created a landscape item. It created an element. If you just think about that flow, and the story of the tree is told through the dead pieces, right? Here you see these big, and notice these big, large, chunky. These don't have fine little pieces. They don't have detailed little portions. These pieces have been experiencing the influence of the elements for a very prolonged period of time. Notice how stubby they are kind of turning back into that elemental force. 
Now focus on this front section here, and I'm gonna turn this just a little bit so that you can see against the negative space the details here, but now we start to see this more ribbon-like kind of delicate deadwood. We see a lot more smaller proportional features. We see a lot less texture and ruggedness on this. This is showing you where there was more opportunity for these elements to exist over the course of time, and that theme plays into the general movement and notion and flow that is coming with this massive mobility out of the stone. Now I'm just gonna show you just so that we're all clear because the first question that's gonna be asked is does this tree stand by itself? This tree completely and totally stands by itself, right? The rock, perfect counter anchor to the, to the um, size of the tree. We do want to enhance its visual as well as its physical stability but still stay with this very dramatic and consistent theme that we've created throughout this and why or how does this connect to the Rocky Mountains? I'm gonna put this back in so we, that we have stability over the work. How does this connect to the Rocky Mountains? The wind of the, of the jet stream, the circular flow of the elemental influences coming off, the environmental influences coming off of the Gulf of Mexico. When these two winds and these forces combined over the top of the Rockies, the amount of wind influence, the amount of force the amount of absolute chaos and gale force winds that start to occur changes the scope and the shape of these trees in a way that I do not know of another mountainous environment that has that same impact. It is very, very dramatic. And uh, the team was in the Rockies uh, earlier this summer documenting that exact occurrence on a different species of tree, but the continuation and the understanding of those elemental forces left a really significant mark, okay? So let's get down to the notion of how do we then take those elemental forces, carry forward the thematics that are set in the bulk features of the tree as well as in the details. How do we take those pieces and work those through the living mass to carry that thematic forward? And this is really when we start to talk about change of scale, change of proportion, and change of design execution to really highlight those features that sit independent and outside of the traditional model and definitively represent nature in miniature. But there are traditional aspects of this inside of this tree. Let me rotate this for forward for you so you can see what we're dealing with here, and it's gonna get real big in your screen for a minute, okay? Now this branch right here, this has dead wood, and if we could just kind of get the detail running through this, L dead wood and living vein intertwining in a, in a variety of different ways and relationships and proportion, and you can see right through here all of these features and how the living tissue kind of surrounds the dead wood. There is no opportunity to split here. There is no opportunity that I have inside of the structure of this. Because I've got deadwood here, I've got deadwood on the, the backside, I've got a living vein on both sides of this. This is a catastrophic element that, 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 uh, or series of events that has created this and it's also made it technically impossible to remove the deadwood and have big time mobility here. However, this is sitting so far back. Here's our apex, here's the rear side, and to get that dead wood, we really do need to move this forward. We are going to try and reposition this first and foremost with just a simple guy wire. How far can we push it? How much tolerance does the wood have? How far can we stress that dead wood, potentially crack that dead wood, potentially have those live veins start to tear but not break before we hit the tolerance of the tree? That is uh, action number one that I'm gonna perform, okay? Action number two, this piece right here. Now most people are gonna say, why? Why save this piece? Notice how far to the back this is. You see the front to back depth of the material. Why save this piece? Because one of the nuances, if you start to say, what makes a juniper a natural representation of a juniper? And it does depend on the species. Sierra juniper in the Sierra Nevadas, top of the granite domes, it's gonna look like a bonsai. It's gonna look like a bonsai in miniature. It's, it is the single most bonsai looking tree I've ever seen when you see those forces of snow acting on that and the branches dropping down and the massive trunk creating this big powerful design nuance, right? But when we talk about wind having more of the design load, carrying more of that natural connotation, this is when we start to see the necessity to raise those branches, to lighten those branches. And that piece in the back is what gives rise to this notion of these delicate pieces following that kind of environmental influence. My goal with this piece 
in the rear of the tree is to bring it into the upper foreground right here and have it provide depth because my apex is forward, this branch will be forward, this piece in the back here is actually what's going to maintain the significant front to back that gives rise to an incredibly impressive natural representation, okay? So, to begin things, I'm gonna dig into the structural work here, okay? Now, when we talk about this structural work, and we talk about the strategy behind big structural setting. Is this a piece of material that's accessible to the beginner? Uh, probably not, probably not. I mean, uh, anybody, anybody can access a, a, a high level piece of material from a, you know, a collector. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be fruitful. Is this a piece of material that really does demand a lot of technique? Absolutely, okay? And so when we get into this, to use a piece of material like this to help us understand the strategy of structural setting, the concepts and nuances of design, to understand the techniques that we can use based on the constraints of the material to move and set the structure, this is one of the biggest things you derive from a complex piece of material. Plus the transition from raw to refined over the course of the styling process can be very dramatic. The goal here absolute accuracy in the execution of our technique. Now because I have deadwood, and the deadwood runs all the way to the tip of this branch here, I have a significant piece of deadwood, and then this is the first time, this small little tip right here, that's the first time that I have freedom of mobility. But I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna anchor my four gauge all the way back here. You see that copper wire kind of crossing right there? There's that movement. I'm gonna be anchoring to a dead piece right in here, preformed hook. I'll show you that preformed hook. I'm gonna use this piece of wire to hold the living tissue together with the dead wood and to give me the mobility just here at the tip and with the control of this big length so that we have the ability to move this forward towards the front engage the viewer, pull it into the deadwood, and start to really change the plane of existence in the field that this foliar mass represents. And I'm also going to use this, this piece of structural wire as an anchor for my guy wire, okay? So first and foremost, we're gonna start with the preformed hook, okay? Now preformed hook, this is a technique that we talk about a lot at Mirai. Still, still, I want students, I want you to focus your efforts on a really beautifully, technically sound preform hook. Josh, bring me into that detail. Okay, when we talk about the preform hook, not only do we have the preform here, notice that I've already built in the curvature of the branch so that once I put that hook on that piece of deadwood, assuming it sits well, I don't have to torque it to get this arc in. This is a big part of success, especially on a smaller juniper branch riddled with deadwood. I don't want to apply a tremendous amount of pressure bending this onto the living tissue. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of feed this through the finer network of branches here. And when we execute preformed hook, biggest thing that we can ensure is that we have a really nice snug fit. And that can take a few different tries insist upon excellence, okay? Now I'm just gonna show you here. There's my preformed hook. Let's see how that sits. And I wanna nestle that up. Let me go ahead, I'm just gonna drop that right real quick. I'm gonna move that up and in. Oh, like a glove, like a glove. Could not have fit better. Now you notice that if I start to bend this, that preformed hook, when I start to move this wire, is dead set on that branch. You see the arc here? Notice that we've started the arc. The contact at the point where it exits that junction is impeccable. I'm gonna go ahead, let me just show you that again. Beautiful preformed hook, not too much. I don't wanna squeeze it. It's on a living branch. This is a living piece. Now I'm just gonna go ahead, I'm gonna support. Get this over that deadwood feature. I'm gonna support and come on over. And this is a perfectly anchored structural wire. The purpose of the preform hook, I do not have another combination to be using a four gauge width down this far, I would never carry the wire down this structural branch with that deadwood, it has no function. If wire has no function, it only serves to spoil the aesthetic, right? Don't use wire unless you absolutely have to. Guy wires and the utilization of preform hook to isolate singular events, this needs a four. I need protection to hold the living tissue and the deadwood together. One of the, the most uh, profound and I think fundamental Right, Fundamental techniques, these are techniques that are well within all of our capacity to be able to execute and execute in a manner that not only, not only aesthetically looks really beautiful, but also functionally gives us an incredible, an incredible degree of power and ability to change the shape of the tree, okay? 
And I, and I say this before, I say this again for, for all of the members that have heard this and are going to roll their eyes. Mr. Kimura used to always say, consist look, consistency is the name of the game in bonsai. And he used to always say, hey, setting the structure, 90% of the work. 90% of the work is setting the structure. These techniques, what is the limitation of being able to handle a piece of material like this? The ability to move big, solid, structural pieces. Every piece of movement starts at the shoulder. If I'm gonna drop, I drop from here. If I'm gonna raise, I raise from here. Okay, the fact that I'm using this out on the tip, the guy wire is gonna become the mobility point, right? But this is giving me all of the support after the guy wires happen, that crack, that tear, that twist, that I don't wanna to touch and fudge with anymore. I've already put the four gauge on. I've already given myself a technical advantage in the structural setting to ensure success. Imagine pushing this tissue to a degree of failure and then trying to apply four gauge. Bad news, right? Proactive setting, it's gonna be utilized as an anchor. These are some of the pieces that strategy allows us to really have success in the structural setting. Okay, I'm gonna carry this onto the bigger of the two because this is the piece, and when we think about where do we carry our structural wire depends on how thick the branches are, where we want to move them, as well as using the wire to proactively head off problems. I have a very delicate crotch here where it splits to this pad and this big long branch. By using the wire on the big long branch, it's not only the piece that I want to move and that needs the thicker wire to have mobility, it's also protecting that crotch. So I get a bonus. I get three in one in terms of the execution of technique by utilizing the piece that we're talking about in the position that we're uh, after, okay? Now, when we make big structural moves, okay, I have a point, I have a point that gives me absolute function. And you've gotta find that point. Now, it doesn't really serve you to find that point of absolute function, meaning a pull point with which the direction of force and the distance to, uh, to dictate the lever arm and the amount of force it takes to bend strike a perfect harmony. Okay, Obviously, the farther and farther out here I get, the less force I have to apply. But I stop focusing the bend on the biggest structural element, and it starts focusing on the weakest possible points in here in the more detailed portions of the branch. So when I start to look at that perfect point, I'm looking all the way back here. Notice where I'm at here. I'm trying to move here or, oh, there it is. Notice that move, same investment of force. Notice that move. You see that difference? That's the one. Now here's the thing. This is at the exact point that my four gauge form the preform hook. This is where we're going to use this piece of structural wire as an anchor for the guy, okay? Now I've been using this gin out here. I'm obviously gonna focus on a real meaty part of the gin so that I have the strength to be able to hold this. And in fact, I even wanna protect that gin if I can. Uh, I'll bypass that tonight. Let's just go ahead and keep, keep kind of crushing forward because if I start doing that kind of stuff, it's gonna take forever. Okay, let me go here. I'm gonna give myself a good measurement. Guy wires should always be done well. This is 12 gauge, I would not go above 12 gauge. Some people are gonna say, why don't you use galvanized steel? Could use galvanized steel, it's down in the greenhouse, right? We're here, copper wire, just as good um, in terms of, but, but does have a little bit of a larger presence when we start to, to get into the 12 gauge. I'm okay with that, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with there being a homogenous materiality in terms of the guy wires not necessary. We could go with that galvanized steel but the 12 gauge is gonna give us more than enough strength to be able to go ahead and anchor this. And I wanna just be careful as I feed this through the top of that uh, piece of guy wire. That is running and as paralleling, or, or it's uh, forming a perpendicular plane to the living tissue that exists underneath it. If I pull too hard or I get to be a little bit too rough, I can scar up that live vein. I do, I do not wanna scar up the live vein. That, that would be catastrophic on a tree like this, okay? I'm gonna use that four gauge here, both as an anchor point, as well as using the four gauge to give me a little bit of a bumper right here. And let me just show you that, okay? I'm coming across the top of the four gauge here. You see my 12 gauge coming over into this region. Oh, that's a beautiful close up right there. Look at that, okay? This is anchored to this piece. Let me roll it towards you. I've got this piece coming across here, both sides feed around that, and then both sides come through the crotch. Vascular flow goes here, vascular flow goes here. This is a dead spot, not in terms of physically dead, but where the vascular tissue diverges to both branches and there is no crossing of the flow here. Great spot, use that uh, four gauge to bumper that, kind of directs that off 
of this living piece of tissue here. I love this setup. This is beautiful structural setup, and we want everything that we do in structural execution to both be functionally beautiful as well as visually beautiful. Okay, I'm gonna take this up to this piece, and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna use just sort of uh, uh, a um, initial general pull of the 12 gauge to get movement into this branch, okay? Now this is where when I'm functioning on my own, I go ahead and I try to find that really beautiful bend spot where I can, where I can kind of gain leverage and I can really start to apply that move. Now if I'm not pushing on this, right? This is my move right here to push on this. But if I can't push on that, then I've gotta find another way to take up slack. Watch my pliers, okay? My pliers become an application of force and, and although it takes a little bit more time, right? With our pliers, we can use our pliers to really leverage and change that application of force on that branch, boom, okay? These are the types of moves that empower us to change things. Now let's go to the wide just for a moment, okay? Now we're already starting to pull this into a position and notice how the change is upward. This piece was down and this piece was to the back. I wanna bring this up and I wanna bring this into this space. If I can get this branch right here, the game is going to change aesthetically in terms of this tree. This is my defining branch. This guides the movement, it guides the asymmetry. It guides every aspect of the process. One of the most significant things about the Rocky Mountain uh, range, when you get into the rugged, isolated regions, is we do still find in that region some of the most ancient bristlecone, some of the most ancient limber pine, some of the most ancient ponderosa, and some of the most ancient junipers, right? It is a mountain range that holds age. Now, when we look at this design, you look at the deadwood deterioration, you look at the contrast of living and dead, this is an old tree. This is a physically old tree. The material has nothing but age given to it. And the way that we're using design, when you say, how does design represent age? Farther degree of asymmetry with each push. When we get to representing 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 years of age, the farther we get that asymmetrical push out here, the more deadwood, the more remnants that, that, that was, once was, and no longer is this dead backbone and, and this push, right, of asymmetry with the negative space between it, this is visual age. This is visual age as it's applied to a tree if we had to quantify it, okay? So when we start to see this, the material allows us to represent a thousand years of age visually. The material allows us to represent 12 to even 1500 years of age. But if we push this far, and we're gonna stay this far out, the goal is not to compress as if it were a traditional model, we're gonna let this ride. But the farther out you go, you can't have these big branches. You start to create more space between the pads, you start to narrow the pads, you start to thin the pads, and you start to make those smaller and smaller. This is the proportion we started off talking about in terms of the ex execution of aesthetics. Let's continue, let's, let's continue, okay? So I'm gonna work on this and, and this, this kind of pull here, I'm gonna see if I can give myself just a little bit more function. Okay, and I wanna be careful with the dead wood because I am out on a significant piece of leverage. I may change, I may change even to the interior here just because I do see that probably needing. Let me go ahead and I'm gonna down grade my wire. I'm gonna use the 12 gauge to pull. I'm gonna use the 14 gauge to hold. I'm gonna come back to the exact same region. And when we set structure, each piece that we put on, if we think that it is going to be a substitute, then obviously we're gonna handle it with care. If we think it's going to be a temporary piece, still handle it with care. Why still handle it with care? Because oftentimes it's the pieces that you did not anticipate leaving on the tree that become the fundamental anchors for your work and everything when you take away all of the minutia of that structural setting, it needs to look nice, right? There's a mentality that comes with structural setting. Your structural wire looks nice. Same angle, same spacing, no gaps, good contact. You've thought out uh, long and hard how you plan on hitting the functional points in the execution of that application that are gonna maximize, maximize the ability for that wire to do its job, okay? So we're thinking about same angle, same spacing, no gaps. We're thinking about guy wires, appropriate wire gauges, appropriate wire locations, appropriate execution to maximize the aesthetic of the tree. Gosh, I wonder if we could get that right there. Feels like it, feels like it could go. Let's go ahead and see if we can't. 
this guy's our wire just a little bit, just a little bit right here so that we don't wrap it all the way around this piece. Okay, I'm just, this is just a little nuance. This is my own little pet peeve, is can we, can we hide the visibility, the contact of the work? Can we hide the aesthetic of our guy wire underneath some of this really detailed nuance? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna see if I can give myself a little bit more leverage. Use the 12 gauge just to make some ground with the 14. Yes, I like that. Okay, how are we doing there? Yeah, I'm gonna come back and join you for a second just because getting a little bit, oh, that's good. That's really, really good. Okay, becoming a rather lateral line. I think we go up even further. Let's not stop the process. This line right here, right? Relatively lateral, we want that to just have a slight upward angle. We come down. Come back up, notice the lines here. We come down, come back up. That's a reference line right there. This is a reference line right here too. Okay, let's see if we can play on that. All right. Okay. You know, this is the first one. And again, I wanna push. I wanna push as hard as I can. There we go. I wanna push as hard as I can here. Okay, now that, that sound, there's historically two separate sounds that we're gonna hear in the bonsai practice. There's the sound of breaking dead wood, and there's the sound of breaking living tissue. Okay, that was the sound of dead wood. And that was the sound of dead wood splitting, and I'm guessing, right, this will be uh, a little bit more dramatic if I look at it and the live vein just split in half, but my guess is the dead wood opened up like a book. Let's take, let's take a small little peek. Yeah. Yep, opened up perfectly. Opened up perfectly. Okay, Jesus, can you see right in here? Can you see that little... That little split right there? Uh, yep, let me show you right there. There it is, bring me in tight there, Josh. Okay, so now when we see this, we're moving this branch that way, and you see that point where there's a lot of tension. Now this, this tells me that the focal point of that bend, this, this live vein, is very much in the danger zone. Will this continue to tear along here? And will this separate, or is this gonna split right across the living tissue right here? I do not know. So now we have to start to be careful. This is where we have to recognize we're in the danger zone here, because if that moves across the living tissue, this whole branch, or at least a significant portion of it, I do have a living vein on the bottom here, that will kill that branch. Let's take a look, let's keep working, okay? We can't, we can't pursue the creation of bonsai uh, and limit our capacity out of fear. We really do need, to the best of our ability, to kind of push past that and just recognize that through the acknowledgement of the physiology, through the understanding of the structure of the wood, of the technique, of the tree, etc., we can do this kind of work very, very successfully. Very successfully, okay? And each time that I make another move, I wanna come back and check. Let's take a look again, Jesus. We'll watch this just open up. Let me go ahead and give you that right there. Okay, so we see it starting to open and now I wanna be paying particular attention. Now it's making the turn around this living vein right here. It's making this turn right here. That's perfect. If we can keep that tearing along here and this piece splits out and we get this elbow right here to really tighten up, that would be ideal circumstances. I will tell you that the movement of this piece, it relieved the tension on this piece of dead wood and it has gotten much, much softer, but we still have a significant degree to which we aspire to move this. Let's continue the process. Okay, and some people might be saying, why don't you cut that wire? I like having the wire here. That wire uh, gives me leverage opportunities when I leave that length to be able to utilize. Notice that I'm not cutting either one of these. This is a great grip point for my execution of technique, okay? As well as when we start to kind of talk about maybe needing a little bit more usable. Now notice where my pliers are on this. My pliers are all the way out in the middle of that, okay? Really giving me a lot of opportunity to kind of work with. Ooh, there it goes. Okay, and then I tighten up my 14. We're eventually gonna release the tension and tighten up the 14 and the 14 alone, okay? Let's take a look. Oh, okay. 
There it goes. We have just hit, we have just hit our max capacity. Okay, because we are getting tears on both of the live veins, okay, both sides of the live veins. And let me just show you this one here. You just are starting to see the opening incision right there. I mean, this is just starting, just, just starting right here, okay? So that means it's officially started to enter the living tissue. I need to keep this as intact as possible, and it's already split all the way up into here, okay? Because I'm taking this flat live vein and I'm forcing that flat live vein, it's like a finger, okay? Let's come back to this and let's just understand this. Okay, I've got my finger here. If I try to bend, and Lonnie, just go ahead and zoom in here just so we understand. Yeah, give me that tight end, Josh. Okay, when we start to look at this, if I try to bend my finger this way, it doesn't want to bend. That's how you break a finger. That's also how you break a live vein. Now, if I want to bend my finger this way, it's meant to bend that way, right? So if we put the live vein under tension on the outside, compression on the inside, it bends favorably. If we have tension on the outside, compression on the inside, and we try to bend it in these ways against the knuckle, that is a recipe for disaster, and this is exactly what we are looking at when we start to focus on this area, okay? When I look on the underside, I've got another small little bit of living tissue that's opened up. Not concerning, not concerning yet anyways, right? But we don't want to push it any further. And I'm actually going to go ahead now. If I'm going to undo this 12 gauge, I'm actually going to release one or two turns. I'm going to allow the, the 14 to kind of stretch. I'm going to allow that 14 to kind of hold that weight. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to tighten that 12 back up. Okay, come back into the 14, get one more turn or two just to make sure it's uh, got the hold. And now I'm not going to cut the 12. I'm going to unwrap the 12, okay? Because unwrapping the 12 releases the tension. If you cut, boom, it springs back can be really, really damaging to the vascular tissue. No movement, exactly how we want to relieve that piece. I'm going to go ahead and now cut this to a, a, an agreeable length, and now I can go ahead and I can take this 12 off. And that sets the first major piece, okay? Now I know that I want an upward angle out here. Did we get the upward angle that we wanted? Let me take you back. Not necessarily, but we still have the opportunity to act on this piece here. Now, if we take this and we guy this right here, do I run the risk of further tearing that piece that has already started that break? I do, I do, I do. And I wanna be very respectful of that break. Let me get you back to front. There's front. We're already pulling so much closer to the front. Notice the space that we're engaging here. There is quite a chasm right there between the two. But visually, when we take in the two-dimensional impact of the work, we're starting to create relationships within that area and region of the tree. I don't want to apply this tension right here as a guy wire. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go with the four gauge alone to try and change the contact of the branch to the living tissue right here and see if we can't get a little bit more mobility, okay? So this is a very special, very, very special kind of action that we're gonna perform here from a structural perspective, because I have a counterclockwise motion to my wire, I need to get my hands in here to be able to apply that rotation, okay? Now this is a hook with my thumb, goes right on the top of the wire. And let me see if I can show you this, okay? There it is, I like that right there. Yeah, perfect, okay? Thumb goes on the top of the wire. My index goes right below, and let me just pick that up. My index goes right, right below that crotch because I'm gonna use this as, notice that twist that I get. This is how I distribute. Now, I don't wanna be out here on the finer branches or I'll break that branch right at that crotch. These are the proactive understandings of the structure of the tree. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna use that, okay? And I'm gonna twist, twist, and bend. Okay, now, if I have to predict in the setting of structure, if I have to predict where is it going to tear, I have a gin here and I have the living tissue attached going here. That living tissue is gonna to wanna to tear off of that. It's gonna to wanna to tear off and tear open. So if I'm twisting here and I'm putting the force against that junction of living and dead right there, right, that, that, that junction, I wanna be extremely careful of not applying too much force and tearing that piece off, okay? So I'm gonna continue because the goal again was to have this branch be in front of this piece of deadwood. Let me show you how close we are right now. Let me show you how close we are. We are not far away, okay? We are very close to our goal. These are the small goals that you set 
to be able to give you boundaries in the structural setting. Let me see if we can get there. This is when uh, gluttony can be a little bit of a can be a little bit of a uh, negative Nancy in terms of. Mm. Got it. Got in front. Okay, I got what I wanted, and that's. When you get what you want, will we come back and tighten that guy wire over the course of this tree's existence? Yeah, probably, probably, okay? Do we have kind of a straight line here? Absolutely, this is where branching is gonna be our best friend. Have we engaged with in increasing the degree of asymmetry to tap into the, the life cycle or the age that this material has the capacity to uh, represent? Absolutely, we're on the right track. Big moves for just one single branch but that is the most important branch on the tree. Let's come back to this piece, okay? Once we set this piece, and this piece is gonna demand an entirely different th strategy behind the structural setting. Once we set this piece, we will open it up to questions uh, to catch up with you guys and start to build kind of the information and skills around what we're doing here. I guess I'll set that right there. Okay, now this is an entirely different moment because this piece right here has a piece of, or has 50% of the branch covered in deadwood but my live vein is completely unified. Yes, I love that view. Okay, my live vein is completely unified. Top of the branch is deadwood, and I want to bend up. I want to bend into that deadwood. Best case scenario for a juniper, because if we have the, the, uh, the ability to do either or, I would much rather move compression and take away the deadwood from compression and put the live vein under tension on a juniper, okay? So that means if I'm gonna bend this branch up, I'm bending it up, I'm bending into the deadwood. The deadwood is compressive tissue. We're gonna have to compress to bend it up. The live vein on the bottom is under tension because we're gonna stretch and elongate as we bend up. I would much rather put junipers under tension. I want that to stretch, okay? But I'm gonna to have to remove the compressive tissue. This is a major technique of bending junipers. I'm gonna come in here with my root cutters first. We'll see if my root cutters can create a clean enough incision. I'm gonna move this kind of big chunky, cumbersome branch here, just to see if I can, and move, not remove, but let me just kind of get this out of the way so that I can hopefully safe, safely work, but I don't want to do it at the expense of this branch because it is a big, beautiful branch, and I like the length, right? This has taken this tree uh, five years to give me this kind of length. I've waited five years to style this tree because I needed I needed the elongated growth to be able to generate this wind-influenced form. Uh, five years, short time to wait when you think about this material being four, five, possibly 600 years old, right? This is an old tree. This is an old, old, old tree. Okay, I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna find the margins of my living and dead. And I'm not gonna go ahead and separate the entirety of the thing, but I wanna get a majority of it because otherwise we just end up nibbling, okay? So when we dig in, when I dive into that, and you'll see the split that we formed here. Go ahead and zoom in right here for me. Okay, come on in tight, right? So when we start to look at this, notice how that incision creates that fracture that runs all the way down that piece. Now watch closely, stay in tight for me. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna move this here. Let me get the light. I'm gonna just bump this, boom. Watch this, bump this, boom. See how that opens it up? I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna stretch that until I fracture one of the two sides, okay? This is a big, big moment that creates mobility because now already I've created the capacity to bend. I have a tremendous, notice that red tissue right there. Okay, this is all heartwood. When we talk about the Rocky Mountains, we talk a lot about decomposing uh, geology in the Rocky Mountains and that geology releasing a tremendous amount of mineral content. That mineral content hitching a ride on water and that mineral content hitching a ride on water becoming uh, uh, toxic in terms of, of excess amounts of different heavy metals and decomposing uh, uh, geology that lodges itself in the tree. The tree has to deal with that. The tree has to be able to process that tissue. The tree has to be able to reconcile the presence of those excesses and those toxicities. And that's where you start to see the tree taking sap pockets, rupturing those, the, those, those sap pockets and pushing that sap across the lateral transport mechanisms in the vascular tissue of a juniper. And, and those, lateral, the, those lateral transport mechanisms, storing those resources and storing that energy in the heartwood of that tree, okay? And that's how, that's how you get the formation of heartwood. Now, most people would say, oh, heartwood, rot resistant, heartwood, 
uh, structurally sound. These are all of the big biology terms that, that sort of, that go into the processing of heartwood as a tissue. But in all actuality, heartwood for the tree is a dump site. It's a deposit site where sap takes toxicity, crosses the cellular membranes on a lateral direction, which closes lateral mobility, locks it up in the core, which reduces central water transport, and that is what creates veins specific, right? One vein to one root, one vein supporting one foyer mass to one significant root, in this case planted in the stone. That's what gives junipers their dead live contrast and interaction. Really fascinating characteristic that we're witnessing here, okay? Now, I've, I've necked this down, and you see this singular area. I do have a very valuable branch right here. I have a very, very valuable branch right there. And I want to be respectful of that branch because that very, very valuable branch, when we start to look at it, is going to give us the capacity to create not just one level out here at the tip, but a whole other level of design inside of this big branch that's coming to the upper piece. Now, I need to protect this now. Okay, because we've just made a very major incision. We've taken away 50% of the tissue. This is now incredibly fragile, right? We know we're gonna have to bend this. We know that there's quite a bit of heartwood in there. I'm gonna get a little bit more of that ridge out before I go ahead and I lay that wire spine in, but the wire spine being a track, a guide, if you will, for the juniper to bend on, this is fundamental juniper bending technique. As advanced as this may look, this is what it takes to be able to handle juniper collected material or even old or even uh, established bonsai material. When you look at some of the most profound and some of the most prominent workings of junipers in the, in the bonsai magazines around the world, it's the reworking of old material, maybe old field grown material, but old material. And that old material, even in the field, can have a significant amount of heartwood. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna set up my wire spine. Is. I'm using four gauge for this and I've got kind of a smorgasbord of opportunities here. I've got this piece that could benefit from a little bit of four gauge, but I want to be thinking about, I want a clockwise rotation on this, right? This tissue has this kind of clockwise rotation working through here. I want that clockwise rotation. You see this comes from here, comes across here, ever so subtly rotating clockwise. So that means that my wire coming from back here needs to be wrapping clockwise and I wanna lay it right into that channel, okay? So that gives me my guide for how I go about the pairing process. I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna use a, a, a branch back here that has a little bit of deadwood attached and I'm gonna go ahead and formally wire these two pieces, okay? I'm gonna carry I'm gonna carry my four gauge that's gonna serve as the backbone for my big bend. I've gotta get it around this branch that I've moved out of the way so that we can see in function. And just kind of delicately work through these very, very small branchlets on Rocky Mountain Juniper. If we crash through these, we do so much damage. We've gotta be very, 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 very careful when working with Rocky Mountain Juniper. The finer the branching on the juniper or, or any species for, or, of tree for that matter, we see this with spruce and the Ezo, the finer the branching, the more delicate the more delicate and the more technically demanding the work, okay? Because you've got a finer vascular connection, which means you have less room for error, you have less room for damage, and you have a lot more opportunity to inflict harm upon that piece, okay? I want this piece to have significant contact, and if I can, if I can, I would love to have at least a turn that gives me solidarity in terms of its anchoring and its immobility before I lay it down as a linear structural piece that's going to guide the bend. And again, this wire spine, this wire spine is going to be the backbone. It's going to hold the shape of this bend and it's gonna make sure that the tissue that, that is being bent follows a nice structural track, okay? I wanna get this all the way in here and I want this to be in perfect contact, perfect, perfect contact with my branch. This requires quite a bit of hand strength. Okay, so you're gonna watch me. You're gonna watch me move it up and lay it down. You're gonna watch me move it up and lay it down. Up, lay it down. Is this work hardening it? Absolutely. Okay, am I doing it to work harden it? No. I'm doing it so that I get this set right in perfect contact. Deadwood wedge, looking to dump me off the stool. I want this in perfect contact with that tissue and I want that wire centered on that tissue, okay? 
I'm almost thick enough that I could potentially look to two wires, but I think I'm gonna be able to get away with it with one, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna hold that, all right? Now I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna grab just, just a nice singular piece of raffia. Singular piece of raffia so that I can tie that on and secure that system. And then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna apply the raffia. While I'm applying the raffia, I will happily answer questions. We are almost to the point. Be sure you get your questions into Diana. Yes, I have a couple. Okay, hang on, hang on. Sure. Let me get the raffia. Let me get this tied in. And then as I'm applying the raffia, you can rock and roll. Okay, one more little piece here. Okay, I'm going to get this tied in. I'm going to tie it at a point where I have a branch as a bumper. Boom. Okay, now again, the whole reason I'm going through this trouble is because this little branch has this kind of living, flagging kind of outlier. This is actually a big part of wind influence. When you see the erratic nature of the deadwood on a juniper, recognize that, that the erratic nature of that deadwood, think about that if that deadwood were still alive. That's a major, major opportunity design-wise to explore. To explore the fact that that branch, had it not died, how would that contribute? It would contribute as an irregular outlier of a branch. This is how the wind impacts the tree. Junipers being vein specific, when we go into the Rockies, you see junipers, you see the most irregular, disorganized, erratic forms. Now we talked about the Sierra Juniper and the Sierra Nevadas, probably having the closest resemblable form to a bonsai up on the granite peaks. Not in the, not in the meadows where it's gonna be a 60, 80, 100 foot tall juniper, but when you get up onto the exposed granite domes of the Sierras, you see those trees hunched over, smashed by snow and wind, and, and really kind of demonstrating the, the element of bonsai nature and miniature. But the Rockies are different. We're gonna be extending and we're going for an irregular nature. Give me the erratic sort of harsh conditions that give rise to this incredible mountain range. That's what we're aspiring to achieve and those are the elements whose essence we're trying to harness through the work that we're doing on this piece. Again, most of that uh, originating from the fact that we had this piece that needed a special containerized environment. We chose the stone, and inside of that, we're now accommodating those indications and all of those natural nuances and avoiding sort of the domestication of an otherwise very wild and extremely ancient form. Okay, Diana, I'm ready to go. All right, so I think you answered this, but just to double check, do you, did you say how old this was, this tree? I, <clears throat> I'm guessing, and this obviously, everything that we talk about in terms of age as bonsai is a guesstimation. Uh, I'm guessing that this tree is, is, is probably 350, 400 years old, could be as old as 500 years um, based on the deadwood desiccation, etc. It still has the majority of its core wood, so we're not seeing all the way to the central core of the tree. That's really when we know we've tapped into ancient. When you have eroded the dead wood till you get to the very central essence of the tree. And we're not there yet, but we are uh, very far down the erosion. Even when I was climbing the redwoods, I, I was talking to a vascular uh, biologist who was studying redwood vascular structure. And she said, you know, the primary way that we age redwoods, bark formation. Bark formation on a redwood. Like that's their big indicator. Um, and when we look at junipers, a lot of people try to associate the age of junipers a millimeter a year uh, because of the you know, lack of moisture, et cetera. This is uh, a, a gross misinformation. Yeah, this is gross misinformation. You're really looking at the eroded nature of the deadwood and are you getting closer and closer to the central core, right? Because that is when you're going to be getting to the most rot resistant, the most uh, uh, resistant to damage desiccation and the sandblasting effect, which is a big part of the wind acting on Rocky Mountain junipers and giving them their detail. And so when we get to that core, that means time has been not on that tree's side and it has been there for a long time experiencing those elements. I see this and I say, listen, 350, 400 years, I think that's conservative. Cool. Wow. It's always crazy to think about what was happening in the world that long ago. All right, well, ha uh, another question. How heavy is the tree um, in the pot? Yeah, nice, nice. Uh, the tree weighs too much for a single person to carry and almost too much for two people to reasonably carry. Uh, I, I, I could pick this tree up on like my best day and, and, and potentially shift it a few inches. I would say this is probably 200 pounds plus, maybe, maybe even more. Um, 
just because the stone itself is so heavy. Now this is lace rock. Lace rock is a, is a uh, product of volcanic activity flowing through sand and solidifying. And it creates the really interesting air pockets and the really interesting kind of cavernous shapes that uh, that lace rock has become known for, typically sourced out of uh, Utah as the, as the location that gave rise to those conditions. Um, lace rock is, is common in aquariums, common in, um, in, in, in like fish tanks and that kind, of, uh, that kind of endeavor, but it's become a very major resource to be utilizing in bonsai because of the sculptural nature. And you talk about the different types of stone that have kind of made themselves or embedded themselves in bonsai cultures, the Abigawa stone of Japan. Here you have a, a limestone type of rock that is existing as a conglomerate inside of a much harder kind of basalt, darker, blacker um, stone. And that combination of the soft limestone, when you look at Abigawa stone, they typically would source that uh, or soak that inside of an acid vat solution, muriatic acid. And that muriatic acid would corrode the lime. It would eat, it would eat up that, that uh, calcium-based central softer stone and it would leave behind the rock hard, really dark stone that Abigawa are prized for. And that's how you got all of those contours that existed inside of that stone. In the case of lace rock, you're talking about lava and uh, a type of lava, but it's a type of lava that has a significant structural inferiority based on the fact that it moved through sand and also carried with it large quantities of that sand. So there is a soft, fractured nature to lace rock. In fact, when they quarry lace rock, they have to do it by hand because a machine would destroy it, which is why it's so expensive. Um, but it is very sculptural and it is very beautiful. And it's become more and more iconic of kind of Western bonsai and the function of stone as a materiality inside of the practice. A couple of people were wondering when the deadwood broke earlier, if there was, why you weren't using raffia during ah, that process. Because I want to watch when I'm bending deadwood, raffia does not stop deadwood from breaking. Raffia stops and distributes the force that I apply to living tissue. So if I'm bending dead wood, I wanna see that. I have to be able to watch that portion and see what happens. You hear that pop, it's covered with raffia. I never would have known when the live vein started to tear in a way that was going to be detrimental and that live vein would never have popped. It would just tear and tear and tear until there was no more connectivity. So when we are bending in these directions, right? We're using our finger, there we go. We're using our finger correctly. I can apply raffia and on that piece put under tension, raffia holds, it applies an inward force through that compression. And that, that piece is put under tension and it's stretching and stretching and raffia is saying, no, no, no. Stay against the wire, hold the form. Come on, you're good. That's what allows us to push the, push the severity of the bend. It does not function right here. The deadwood's gonna break regardless. If I have raffia on that, I can't see everything else. I make big mistakes, okay? Use raffia cautiously, okay? Raffia is a tool for specific situations. We tend to think, I'm gonna bend something, put raffia on it, put raffia. That, that's gonna make it better. Mm -mm. Not, all, not all the time. And in fact, sometimes raffia can be the exact reason. In this instance, is case in point, I would have failed had I applied raffia. All right. Mm. Uh, next question is from Treebeard Steve. Can, can the techniques you're demonstrating and discussing be applied to other members of the supracese, such as Thuya? Um, definitely when you start to, so first and foremost, you know, the, the separation, the removal of compressive tissue uh, and putting the living tissue under tension I would say that uh, assuming you're working in the natural bend, so notice this has a natural arc here, it has this, this swoop, and I'm gonna be bending it, I'm gonna be further enhancing that arc, boom. Arc, I'm working within it, that means this tissue's already geared for compression. If I tried to bend this this way, if I tried to bend against this arc, I'm definitely gonna break this tissue, because this is already compressive tissue, or this is already compressive, this is already tension. If I continue to put tension-filled tissue under more tension, it has the ability to adjust and stretch, okay? So I'm working with the natural movement that exists here. If you're working in that spirit, in that capacity, most other trees 
uh, and species do have techniques that allow you to remove compression and put the tissue under tension. Case in point is the wedging technique with pines. You cut out the compressive tissue and you bend against that compressive tissue to close the, the wedge, right? So you're putting the remaining tissue under tension, right? Exact same strategy. When we start to see that you want to have that living tissue under tension, that has the ability to stretch and that has the ability to truly execute a beautiful bend. In terms of thuya, when we talk about cupressacea family, um, thuya, what is thuya's technique? I think this is still in question, right? What is pseudotsugamensaceae's technique? That's still in question. Uh, when we're looking at these pieces, I don't think that there's been enough exploration of what, what could potentially be the technique of choice to manipulate the vascular tissue, but that's something that we continue to work on. This is part of the process of bonsai. The evolution of knowledge never, ever stops. And these are species, when we go to Japan, that don't exist. They don't exist. We have Camisiparis, which is similar to Thuya in terms of the Hinoki, but we don't really have the ability to say, oh man, Thuya, we can manipulate the tissue in all of these different ways. That's something that we gotta figure out. My assumption is you could remove the compressive tissue on Thuya because Thuya over the course of time will create vein specific growth. And that's a really interesting revelation to come to. The longer you use Thuya, the more older specimens you're exposed to, the more you recognize, ooh, these kind of look like juniper in the way that they age over hundreds if not thousands of years. That is, that is an indication when you see that tissue behavior of how we can treat them technically in the bonsai action. We're good on questions. Great, okay. So I'm just getting to the end of the raffia. Now I wanna again bring some focus back to the Rocky Mountain Bonsai Society. They're sponsoring this stream so that we can make this stream public. And again, a very near and dear community to my heart, Tom Engelwitz and the whole crew, uh, Adam Johnson, Todd Schlafer, Will Kearns, Harold Sasaki, my original mentor, uh, Larry Jackal and his role that he's playing at the Denver Botanical Gardens uh, Bonsai Collection. If you haven't been, go check it out. Really interesting, a rich history there. There's a podcast that was done by, I'm trying to think who did that podcast. They did a really deep dive into the, the internment camp history in Colorado and sort of the birth and continuation, the perpetuation of, of the bonsai practice in the Rocky Mountains. And it was fascinating to recognize how historical uh, the Rocky Mountain Bonsai Society is and the community in that region um, based on sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the perpetuation of Japanese culture post-World uh, War II traumatic events. It has been a consistent bonsai hotbed for the duration of its presence, and I think it's also been one of the true breeding grounds for the pursuit of bonsai with native material. So how appropriate to be exploring a Rocky Mountain native showing the fruits of the elements acting on the Rocky Mountain than to be exploring a Rocky Mountain juniper. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna use this same piece of deadwood, but I am gonna pull from the interior here. The farther out I get on a piece of deadwood, the more leverage, longer the lever arm, more leverage I apply, more fragile that gets. And both these bends adding up on this piece of deadwood could potentially uh, cause me to have failure. So I wanna be very, very cautious and I wanna be very, very considerate of the age as well as the fragility, the, 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 the brittleness of this wood, okay? I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna go with a 16 on this one. I don't have as much force I'm going to be exerting. I wanna keep the work as clean as possible when using guy wires, trying to use as thin of a guy wire as possible, as invisible of a piece as possible, as unobstructive of a gauge as possible is how we go about doing the work in a way that really does maximize the quality visually of the work, right? It has to function, we understand it has to function, but we want to maximize that quality visually as well. It needs to look good and it needs to work well, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and just get myself set up. And I'm gonna be bending. When we talk about that pressure point that allows us to accomplish sort of a maximum degree of bend, on this piece, because I have deadwood carried out all the way out this tissue, and you see that deadwood, you see that living vein, you see the deadwood here, which means a significant portion of this is, is deceased. Okay, this is a moment where I start to recognize, ah, okay, I, I can go ahead and I can utilize 
the rigidity, and when I, when I start to talk about rigidity, I'm just going to get that branch out of the way. I can utilize the rigidity of the fact that that dead wood bend, and I can get out here. I might even be able to, let me just see what, yeah, I might even be able to work all the way out here and really apply a significant length of lever arm to this piece. I feel like that's going to have a lot of staying power because I've got that dead wood backbone, and that's going to allow that to move. I like that, okay? I'm not gonna go ahead and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go with this piece because it's gonna be unwinding what I'm already doing with the clockwise direction, but I'm gonna put a little piece of, of rubber here, okay? Nice and clean, minimal application to the living vein. And this is a, when you talk about the complexity of the structural work and the strategy, it takes a lot of effort to do what seems like a minimal amount of movement. I'm not flipping this tree upside down. I'm moving these branches a few inches, okay? But I'm moving the branches a few inches at the base, at the shoulder, at the point of origin, at the most structurally connected moment on that branch. And again, understand, when you start to talk about the influence of wind, we are talking about wind carrying pieces up and out, right? But when you want to get this branch to here, up in here, you don't want to do this. That's not a good branch shape, right? You have to ro roll here. Now, this is a small move right here. That's a small move to change this a significant degree. Look at that. Small move. But that's your point of greatest focal force. That's your point of greatest holding capacity at the vacu vac vascular connection. So the reason we have to go through all this work to appropriately set structure for the future of a really good solid bone system in, in the creation of this miniature representation is because we're moving the most focalized point of stability in the connection of that tree's branches to its trunk, okay? And if you forego this, so many people try to shortcut this moment, okay? If you forego the appropriate, I'm gonna have to pull out here. Boy, that's dangerous, huh? That is danger, danger deluxe, but we're going to go for it. Okay, if you forego that heavy piece of work to move that structural element, the tree will never improve to the degree that it could. And here's the other thing. The more that you, the, the longer that you wait, the more that you put that off. You say, oh, I don't have to do it this time. I can come back and I can set structure next time. The more you put that off, the harder it is. The harder it is to get that move to be made. Okay, now I'm just using the wire as the, the lever mechanism, okay? I would not suggest, if you're doing very sensitive, delicate bends, I would not suggest this technique because you don't have any control. But because I'm using such a long lever arm, I can use that leverage to give myself a significant degree of movement and start to really uh, advance that design to a significant degree. Now, I'm gonna start to be a little bit more calculated here as we get into this. And that means I'm just gonna kind of Use my legs as a prop, take some of that force off of the branch. Once I get that force, I can use my uh, pliers as a pry mechanism as well. Okay, and let me just try and keep that down as far as I can, okay? You can see how far we've already brought it, coming very, very, very far into the foreground. And I'm gonna just tighten this up for a minute and we're gonna see, I want you to see how far we've moved this piece because it has come a significant way. Let me go ahead and let me rotate this out. Okay, so that piece was out here. Now we are here, all right? Really starting to streamline. We're almost now in a, in a parallel to the back of the stone. I really like that. Let me show you that. There's the back of the stone. You see how far up we brought this. Now, do we need to bring this down? I want this to come down. Let me show you what happens when that comes down. Again, we want this to be this wonderfully irregular flagging piece right here. These pieces are gonna be separate and now you start to see that piece kind of hanging out here as its own little universe. How are we gonna get that done? We're gonna pull it down. We're gonna pull it down to the bottom of this piece. We're not applying pressure in the direction that this bottom branch bent. We're just gonna go ahead and we're just gonna give this a little kiss down here to pull that out into that visible area and give us that depth. That's what we want, we want that depth, okay? I'm gonna come back with a little bit of 18. I'm gonna be working with two different directional poles here now in terms of the structural mobility. Go ahead and get this lined up, yeah, beautiful. Okay, let me 
just going to see if I can hang this right on that piece of dead wood. Let me just come down here, and I'm just going to use the very base here, okay? I don't want to get out onto the tips. Use the very, very base. Keep it towards the base. That's where the structure is the strongest. Grab that wire. And let me just go ahead. Okay, now I have to be very, very careful here because I am bending, I am taking that live vein and that live vein where it's being bent here, I'm kind of rotating on that strap right there. When we talk about live veins are like a tape measure, right? And we can, we can flex here, we can flex here. You can roll that tape measure, okay? You can bend that tape measure, right? But you can't tear the tape measure. That's the move that's dangerous. So when I'm rolling here, I'm rolling with the clockwise direction of my raffia. I'm rolling with the clockwise direction of my wire. All of that was preconceived based on the rotation of the branch and I have to continue to function inside of the natural constraints of that tissue, right? When you're out on the rock and, you're, and that wind is blowing across these trees, you know the trees that survive are the trees that have rotation. And the reason that they survive is because that force is not applied to a straight grain tree. Straight grain tree breaks. Rotational tree bends, bends, right? And that's where you get those barber pole pines. That's where you see the junipers twisting. Now, is it the wind that causes the juniper to twist? No, I do not believe so. I believe it is the deadwood contraction, live vein expansion. I believe it's one pocket of roots having more moisture, one pocket of roots having less. Different growth rates cause pull and push and pull. Dead and live, pull and push. Those are the two notions that I believe contribute to the contortion that we see in those junipers. But the ones that last are the ones that have that rotational capacity to absorb that impact of the wind and that constant torsion is what relieves a lot of the focalized bend on a singular point of a straight grain tree. These are nuances that we play with when we're setting the structure of bonsai. We have to understand these. These are tree tolerances they deal with in our boriculture. These are aspects of, of big tree uh, physiology and vascular conduct. All of these connect when we start to dig into this knowledge base around the formation of that vascular tissue. It's very fascinating, okay? So as I move back here, I wanna see Am I seeing this enough? I see this as this far point. I have these pieces that are gonna be existing here. I want more, I want more. Do you want more? I want more, okay? Let's see if we can get a little bit more here. Now I'm gonna to have to be pulling on both of these pieces. Let me just see, let me make sure everything's holding together. I'm getting a nice smooth bend, I like it. Okay, let me go ahead and I'm gonna pull up. This pulls more into the canopy. I'm now drawing it in. Okay, so let me go up, tighten. Okay, now let me come down. This is gonna pull back in this direction here. Come on down. Okay, I'm staying near the base and I want to be pulling this in down, in down, so that we elongate this piece from the back and it starts to really give us some flow up in that apical region. This is where we're gonna see wind kind of carrying through that continuation of the shape. Okay, and I start to see this now. Now I'm starting to get that tip out. I like that tip out. I like seeing this line coming at a diagonal. Let me just show you that through the canopy. You kind of see this line right here coming at that diagonal. Let me trace that, there you go, okay? I want more, let me go more. Okay, now we're starting to get a significant bend here. I would not be surprised if we start to hear a little bit of popping. We know that we are putting the live vein under tension. Popping is to say that the outer bark of the living tissue, a rigid structure, we start to stretch, 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 and that can go, but it's just the bark. It's not the living vein, okay? The living vein, when we hear the bark pop, it's a dull, right? When we hear the living vein, it's high, high pitched. That's the, that's the vascular tissue fracturing, okay? So we have different, different indicators to the severity of what is the response to the bend that we're performing. You gotta hear a lot of junipers break to understand the difference there. Got a little bit of bark. I heard it. I heard it. A little bit of that. Okay. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. Oh, it's engaging the viewer now. 
Now you're starting to get the mojo. Boy, look at how powerful. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. But look at this line. And look at that line. Look at the line of that living tissue. Look at that one. And look at that one. Okay, not the bottom one. Not that point right there. Is that going up? Very, very subtle. Very, very subtle. Some of you guys might be saying, dude, you're totally wishing. And you could be right. But I see that starting to make that upward move. That's the tissue relaxing. This tissue where that break occurred right here is relaxing and it's starting to give way to the force of that gin holding onto that wire. We're really starting to move this tree. Now, let's understand that this branch right there, that farthest point right there, that's the branch from the back. Now we've officially got it to peekaboo out. We see the crossing, and this is tough to see, crossing across the diagonal here. Where does that diagonal line work inside of this design? This, this diagonal line here. That's a big moment in the wind influence. Boom, boom. We're gonna carry that piece out. Let's put a little bit of structural wire on that. Once I get this set, I'm gonna open it up to questions again if there are any that have accumulated. And then I wanna go through the process of setting some secondaries, opening up the crown, defining the right side, taking on that influence of wind as the wind comes bowling over the stone. We're really starting to get into those elements and tapping into some of that potential. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna to try to rotate this up and out here. Okay, so I wanna consider when I'm applying this, now I've put this under significant tension. Now I warned you about this. I said, you don't wanna do that. Look at what I've just done. I've just done what I said you don't wanna do. I'm using eight gauge for this. Okay, this is not a four gauge moment. And this is where making the decision to say, hey, listen, I don't know how this is gonna go. Are we gonna get it there? Am I gonna have to further thin, separate, bend, etc.? We got it to where we wanted it to go. This means that we can use a lighter gauge just to work on the tips here. And I'm gonna be rotating out counterclockwise Clockwise here, bing, rotates that out, okay? Clockwise here, boom, rotates that out. I'm gonna go clock on the bottom, counter on the top. That sets my strategy for the application of structural wire. Whenever you design bonsai, you have to understand the strategy of structural wire. There are a lot of professionals in the world that wire the structure, wire all of the secondaries, wire all the tertiaries, and then they start to style the tree. Structural wire functions through rotation and contact with the shoulder. If you do not know where that branch is going, you cannot wire that appropriately, right? Be sure, and in the beginning, right, if you're taught that way to wire first, style second, then it becomes a habit that is tough to break. If you are starting to do the bonsai practice and you're at the very beginning, train yourself from the beginning. Do yourself a significant service. Train yourself from the beginning to go, for, go ahead and, and wire and bend, wire and bend. As I apply a wire, I position the branch that it's been applied to. Wire, bend, wire, bend, and, and then the next step, think about where you wanna bend and then wire to accomplish that bend, okay? Because now, having wired and bent, wired and bent, you're gonna start to recognize that didn't work out for me. This one did. Why did that one work out and the other one didn't? Because I didn't take into account the rotation and the wire came off and it lost its function. Ugh. Next time I'm gonna think about that. How do I wanna rotate? That becomes an ingrained aspect of the practice. A lot, a lot of discussion about wanting to be better at bonsai. I wanna learn more about bonsai. I wanna do, I wanna, I wanna be able to handle trees like this. Then you have to put the kind of thought and consideration into the application of technique that empowers the design opportunity, that empowers the creativity, okay? Otherwise, we're just kind of swimming in the big blue yonder, right? Like we don't know where we're going or how we get there. And then we start to do it and it doesn't work and we start cranking and poor technique and trees break and branches die and we're like, oh, this is terrible. Do it right the first time. You don't have to worry about any of that. Okay, let me go ahead. This is my extension of length. Love this branch. So incredibly interesting. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead. Give me that rotation. Beautiful, okay, and I'm gonna pull this towards the front. Give me that length, I wanna draw that length out. Okay, Diana, as I'm setting this, if you have any questions that have accumulated, let's dig in. For anybody on Facebook, for anybody that's tuning in on our social channels, YouTube, etc., cetera, live.bonetimeri.com, you wanna interact, you wanna ask questions, start your free trial, you just wanna enjoy, there is an endless amount of bonsai knowledge Tonight's stream brought to you by the Rocky Mountain Bonsai Society in collaboration. 
such a wonderful community of people, such a powerful environment that's given rise to a wonderful bonsai culture in North America. Super excited to be here. What do you got? Question from Kevin Ferris. What will winter storage look like since some big bends have happened? I know right. it will go in the greenhouse, but any other specifics to care for winter? Oof. Yeah, let me tell you something. So one of the things about greenhouse cultivation, and I love that question, because one of the things about greenhouse cultivation that, that, that we need to keep in mind is that a greenhouse demands a tremendous amount of airflow. Okay, so when a greenhouse demands a tremendous amount of airflow and you start putting trees in it that you're trying to protect from the elements because you've, you've done some significant things, maybe you've experienced some damage, obviously we had a little bit of a split, not bad. Nothing here is severe, but this is definitely not gonna overwinter outside. That isn't gonna happen, right? So when we start to talk about that, that airflow that you need to maintain health and a lot of the trees in the greenhouse is the exact same airflow that will dehydrate a tree that has lost the ability to conduct water seamlessly. So one of the big considerations that we've got to think about when we greenhouse a tree that's been worked in the fall season, great time right now. Vascular pro productivity is peaking. We can patch these little pieces of, of damage and wounds very effortlessly, but we do have to understand that we also need to be very aware of dehydration based on that airflow that we need to keep fungal issues down, to keep trees uh, functioning appropriately in a greenhouse, uh, to keep stagnant air, to keep moisture and humidity uh, at bay in terms of the detriment that they can have to oxygen exchange in the roots as well as just stagnant humid air around the foyer mass. That can be the detriment to a juniper and a juniper specifically, a spruce specifically, elongating species. But I would say junipers are our number one concern because this is an awesome time of year to work junipers. This is a great time of year to work junipers. And if you're gonna have to greenhouse them, you are gonna have to deal with that presence of wind in order to keep the conditions correct uh, for not only the trees in the greenhouse, but also keep the wind off that juniper to be able to manage that loss of uh, vascular transport from those breaks, tears, bends, reductions, et cetera. All right, a, a follow-up to that question from Treebeard Steve. Do you expect this tree to be able to stay outside next winter in 2022, 2023? 2022, 2023, um, based on how things have gone so far, I, I, I can't see an issue, uh, 2022, 2023. Okay, now, what's gonna happen? Is this gonna, is everything gonna go swimmingly and according to plan? Is the live vein, you know, uh, gonna tear anymore as the tissue continues to relax? Are there gonna be other problems that we're gonna have to deal with? Is 2022, 2023 gonna be an excessively cold winter that maybe a tree and a stone might not have the capacity to endure? You know, there's so many different factors that we re definitely need to consider. Um, but currently, I would assume with the foyer mass that it has, the success so far protecting it this winter so that it moves through the winter flawlessly, I would predict that this tree will respond very well next year and be strong enough to exist outside. Um, but, but again, let me come back to the materiality uh, discussion just for a minute because this tree being on stone has a far lesser degree of protection in the stone than it would in a much bigger reservoir of a ceramic vessel container. Not that stone doesn't have the same insulation capacity, but the amount of roots that are in the stone versus sitting on the surface of the stone are significant compared to the amount of roots that would be in a pot versus sitting exposed on the surface of the pot. And that is where we see this particular stone holding the tree as such, not providing the same amount of insulation and protection. All right, question from Michael. Would you structure wire the whole tree and then come back to the rest of the wiring or go branch by branch? No, I'm gonna structure wire the whole tree and that's exactly what I'm starting to do now. Because as we start to look through this, I have very, very uh, clear and concise design ideas of how my uh, branches that are creating the def definition of the movement, that are creating the directional insinuation. And again, wind and sort of this thematic of playing on this dramatic environment that is the Rocky Mountains. This is kind of the, the motivation behind this. These are, the, these are the elements that I'm trying to reflect through the structure, okay? So when you start to talk about environmental elements, where do you see the environment? People say the trunk. Yes, you do see the sandblasted nature. You do see the arid nature. You do see the sun-bleached nature of the Rocky Mountain environment in this trunk, to be sure, okay? 
But when you talk about the elements, the elements, whether it's snow dropping the shoulder down, you get this leverage at the tip, drops down. That downward angle of the shoulder, that is snow. That is alpine, right? When we get an upward angle, that is coastal. That's lacking that snow, or that is wind, right? And when you get down with up, that is alpine wind, right? Snow plus wind, bringing that back up. Interesting elements to be combining that shoulder mobility with the function of the rest of the branches to pull together the thematic influences acting on that tree. Okay, let me go ahead and let's just see how we've done here. Yes, I like this now. This is really starting to pull and I'm just looking past the camera behind you. Now let's go ahead and let's start to kind of open up this canopy here. I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna do a little bit of cleaning and I wanna walk you through some of the cleaning that I do here, just in terms of creating an open space. This is a tree that has a lot of burl formation. These older junipers, when you get these kind of irregular, uh, heavily tortured junipers, they can start to perform some very irregular cellular division. That irregular cellular division creates these knuckles. I'm on this knuckle right now, and I wanna be taking out the small spindly pieces on the interior of these knuckles, because those knuckles, that's called epicormic growth when they grow in these sort of basally dominant methods uh, uh, of existence, because they've been battered and beaten, and this is the first junction where water comes through out to the foyer mass in the first junction where sugars and starches accumulate. And that's what causes that continuation of that epicormic growth. Well, if you prune out the weaker pieces here and you leave behind two to three nice, strong, established linear branches, right? We leave behind those two to three really beautiful linear branches. That will train that epicormic growth out of the tree over two to three years. And we see this happening on Shimpaku. We see this happening on several different varieties of junipers. We know they push from the crotch. We don't want our junipers to be pushing from the crotch. Now, when a juniper is recovering, take advantage of that crotch growth. That is photosynthetic mass that starts to produce sugars and starches. A lot of people think when a tree is recovering, take away the crotch growth, makes it stronger. No, it makes it weaker, makes it weaker. That's photosynthetic mass that needs in recovery. But once it's recovered, take away that crotch growth to start to train that linear conduct of water and resources, sugars and starches, and that will build in a more linear, stronger tip, less of that interior budding, less of, less of that amalgamation of growth. Question. Okay. Question related again to the winter time. What happen, What if you don't have a greenhouse? Then you would want to forego doing this kind of severe structural setting at this time of year. Okay, two times of year to do big time structural setting. We talk about spring as the as the green color, the the growing color. This color that the foliage mass has right now, as the as this color returns to the tree, because in another month. Most of our junipers are gonna start to pull that nitrogen, pull that magnesium, pull that iron, all of the things that create the chlorophyll molecule that turns that foliar mass green, they're gonna pull that back into the interior because that is a very cold susceptible uh, uh, plant tissue. So they're gonna reabsorb a lot of that pigmentation, a lot of that energy, and they're gonna store that in their vacuole, and that's gonna decrease the temperature that the water in the vacuole of the cell freezes at, right? This is winter hardiness. Okay, so when that happens and we take on that winter color, it means that the tree no longer has the capacity to be safely worked because it no longer has all of the resources to metabolically compartmentalize any damage that we do through that working, right? And that says, game over. Game over for workability this year. Okay, but if you're worried you don't have a greenhouse, et cetera, wait till next season. And when that green color returns, you have a very significant window where you can do severe work and the tree can respond very, very uh, uh, effectively. Now that window in the spring ends when we see new soft fleshy growth tips on the ends of the branches, okay? That's when we kind of part ways with workability for a juniper in the spring because there's too much water conductivity and now all of a sudden the vascular tissue is easily damaged by that highly saturated water content. All right, next question's from Chris. Where does a bonsai, bonsai enthusiast go about buying a piece of lace rock like this? Oh yeah, uh, stone yards. Look, when you are a bonsai practitioner at the, at the most hardcore level, garden centers, nurseries, all of that stuff for plant material, totally on the table, right? I still, still one of my, although we're working with an incredibly complex, expensive and, 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 and unique uh, piece of material from the Rockies tonight, in celebration of our, uh, of our stream with the Rocky Mountain Bonsai Society, 
the, the ability to find good material at a nursery is still one of my very best, most favorite activities to do on a, on a down day is go look for material but also stone yards because stone yards have slabs, right? They've got different slates and materials that you can create forest plantings on. They've got interesting uh, stones that you might use in your garden as accents. They've got wonderful pieces of contorted stone that could potentially, like this one, hold a really incredible tree. I spend a lot of time in stone yards as I travel. I spend a lot of time in nurseries as I travel. Just part of the game of being in the bonsai practice. Question from Grace. When in their lifespan did junipers start to follow veins? And is the vein an adap adap adaption to environmental stresses? What does the tree gain in exchange for the inability to transport resources laterally? Yeah, so we, we talked about this a little bit earlier from the perspective. Not browbeating you, Grace, but I am going to say, um, when, we, when, we are, when a tree is growing in the native environment, it does not have, and, and these trees are, are highly, highly deprived of resources in terms of moisture, okay? So when it's growing in that native environment and it is deprived of those resources, uh, what ends up happening is the decomposition of the geology in the environment uh, oftentimes breaks down into uh, digestible in terms of the tree having the capacity for that, di that ionic or that decomposed content to hitch a ride on water and cross that cell wall. We get this digestible form of metals and of the geology being broken down, primarily by fungi, primarily by bacteria, and primarily by just natural decomposition, UV and moisture, right? And these are arid, dry areas. This takes a long time, don't get me wrong. But the mineral content, the metal content, and specifically when we talk about aluminum, as a very, very big, most abundant metal that occurs in the Earth's crust and, and the soil systems across the world, one of the most toxic metals for a plant. When a plant needs that water in an arid environment and that water is filled with aluminum and that gets sucked into the cell and now all of a sudden that aluminum is in the structure of the tree, the only thing the tree can do to deal with that toxicity is send sap in, grab onto that toxicity, carry it to the central core of the tree and solidify it as if it were locking up toxicity in concrete, but it's locking it up in resin and that forms the red heartwood. The movement of that sap with that toxicity across the lateral pores, right? We talk about xylem as a tracheid, a straw if you will, but that straw has lateral perforations. When a tree is young, when a juniper is young, it can move resources laterally as well as vertically. It's not vein specific yet. But the more that it takes in those toxicities and those toxicities move through the sap laterally, it clogs up that lateral exchange and you develop vein specific behavior. It's not a choice. It's the mechanism by which a juniper specifically can lock in those toxicities and continue to exist without being poisoned to death. It's a protective mechanism. Okay, now up in this upper area here, I'm just cleaning. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to open up and isolate a little bit more space. And we talked about when we said, listen, what is the vernacular of visual representation of age? Greater degree of asymmetry, remnants of what was, and an expanded quantity of space. Now, this is not where you're gonna see the negative space. Okay, but we also said the farther away from the base you go as you push that degree of asymmetry, the farther out here in this direction you get, the smaller and smaller and the lighter and lighter those pads become. This is the work that we are performing now because I don't want these to be big, heavy branches out here. I need these to be light. I need these to be delicate. And I really want to start to open up and highlight the movement of the live vein as it's interacting with the deadwood in these finer detailed regions. This is what I aspire to show you and this is what we're working on now. Okay, I'm going to come back with a six gauge and I want to define my line base to tip. We defined our asymmetrical defining branch here, biggest point of vascular or, or of foliar flow. We pulled this piece in from the back as a dramatic piece of movement to see how that influences the formation of our apex. Two big moves, define the flow, started to pull in the depth of the design. Now I need to define my line base to tip and establish where is my apex, how are these two pieces working together, and how do these pieces engage with the rest of the tree. I'm going to start to drop off quite a bit of foliar mass because a wind-influenced tree definitely starts to lose a lot of that density with the sail effect, the sail effect. Now it doesn't mean everything should be equally sparse. Positive areas of, of, of foliar space need to 
have a uh, community, if you will, because those are going to create a little bit of a, of a streamlined effect. The mass of that foliage and those small pads, outliers are going to be sheared off through the sail effect, and we're going to get this streamlined mass through these areas that are generating this flow. I want to give that effect through the execution, setting it up with my structure, and then following through with secondary tertiary detailed work. Okay, so let me just work this apex just for a minute. Now, when I'm working on junipers and I'm working inside of living tissue connecting directly to dead tissue, and I'm dealing with structural wire that's coming up over those small living veins that are sandwiched against that dead one, let me just show you this right here. Lonnie, can you see right in here? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so notice that I've got deadwood on the top, I've got this small live vein on the bottom here, and my structural wire comes across this. I have got to be very careful right here, right there. Because if I crush, if I slip, if I grind, that small little live vein is supporting this entire branch out here, and I can crush that in one single move, in one mistake, in one careless moment, I've got to be perfectly on point, gentle, delicate, supporting hand, etc. These are the moments where success in a tree that has this kind of live dead interaction are had, or this is where failure is most seen, in those careless moments with those detailed pieces. And this is where, when I started out cleaning and opening up the branches, the cleaning was as much for the awareness of those danger zones as any other aspect of the design. When I cleaned, when I pruned out those interior pieces, yes, I gave myself access. Yes, it was necessary more than anything. It gave me awareness. And that is very, very valuable when we start to talk about handling material like this, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna give rise to and kind of clarify these areas in here as well. These are very important to understand how are they going to engage. Okay, I'm gonna move back to a 10 gauge. Just that step down, when I carry the eight gauge out to here, I have to be able to have that transition. Okay, I can't go eight gauge to eight gauge. Eight gauge sets the tone for 10 gauge. The structural wire that I apply at the base has to be the biggest gauge that I'm gonna be using on this and we cannot use that same gauge again, right? So that sometimes means that in order to have the natural step down of our wiring hierarchy, I carry eight gauge for a turn and a half, I don't need it any further, I cut it, now I move to 10. The turn and a half of the eight gauge gives me support now I can come back with the 10 and I don't have to do anything. The 10 functions. It functions based on putting the weight, putting that priority on the, on the eight gauge, okay? And that step down, that hierarchy, this is fundamental wiring. This is wiring 101. You've gotta be able to wire if you ever wanna create with bonsai. This is the paintbrush that allows us to really change the shape of the canvas, right? This is how we dictate design in the bonsai practice. Okay, now, my structural branches have a tremendous amount of movement just inherently built in. Most of that movement is li living and dead tissue interacting as one singular uh, combined kind of moment vascularly. So that means when I get to these secondary tertiaries, I don't want to add all kinds of contortion. Quite the opposite, I want to add organization. But I do want to carry forward on that sort of up, out, up, out kind of vibe. So I am gonna to start to raise these pieces. I might drop them down, but I am gonna raise these and I'm gonna to start to unify these little masses right here to be able to create the kind of community that's gonna be uh, tolerant of the wind that's acting on this piece. Okay, let me pull this piece into the mix. And I know this is kind of a big green mass. I know, that, I know it's tough to see, but in order to understand how to work on a tree of this scale and this complexity. This is not easy for me. There's so much going on visually. How do we process it all? You, got to, you have to follow the, the, the consistent course of action, right? We do those big risky moves first. We tackle structure in its entirety, okay? First, the defining branch. Anything that might potentially have failure, this back piece. Define the line base to tip into the apical region. Once you do that, you are off and running. You, you suddenly have a guidepost. Guidepost for what, right? In this bonsai process, this, this process of design, even my most advanced students, I still have to remind them. I still have to remind them. This is how we go about it to give ourselves the ability. Ability to do what? Not the ability to style a bonsai the ability to make sense of complex material. 
Okay, because ultimately I have a vision for this tree. How do you even begin to enact a vision on a complex piece of material with this kind of disorganization? Defining branch, right? Where you find your front, you find your angle. Defining branch, risky moves. Define the line base to tip so we know where our apex is and now everything has a height reference, has a length reference, and pretty soon when we start to wire this out, secondary tertiary has a width, a density, and a pad formation reference. We build from the bottom to the top, we set our guide posts and our bumper rails, and then we function inside of that to execute the remainder of the design. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take this six and I don't wanna compress this too much, okay? I wanna keep this nice and airy out here. But I do wanna bring it down so that I create some synergy. Shoo, right there, Shoo, right? Moving through that. And you can think, you can think about all of the different things that are gonna be happening to the foyer masses as we start to work through this. And I am gonna kind of start to knock off some of these pieces that are counter to that flow. Not all of them, not all of them, but I don't want I don't want the dense, common, traditional bonsai form. I want a sparser representation. I'm gonna come back in here. I'm gonna take off these crotches just so that I can kind of see how long I can make this piece. Pull this in. This is that, this is that length there. There we go. Yes, I love that. I love that. Okay, these pieces down here, let me go ahead and let me clarify some of the, some of the convolution that's occurring down in here. These are, again, those abacormic pieces. We take out a little bit of that mass, take out a little bit of those return branches and some of the density that is existing up in here and that starts to really help us understand and clarify the quality of the design. Okay, because I don't want to try and clean everything to the point that I think I'm gonna want it. So much of the orientation as we're styling and designing this piece is changing. So had I come and taken off all the bottoms and then I wire it and I flip that branch upside down, all the bottoms suddenly become all the tops and we are in a world of hurt. That is a big, big problem, right? But once we position it, now we can come back in and we can start to really clean, we can start to really sculpt through the process of elimination before we ever apply wire. And again, if we wired this whole thing and then we start styling all of this kind of reduction that's setting the tone, you say design is established through branch selection, through branch pruning, this is all helping me start to really paint the picture and create that structure upon which we can execute this design. Okay, if there's any questions, I'll take some questions now as I kind of work through this little time consumptive. We have questions. Let's do it. Uh, question from Kim about the stone. Does it insulate or expose roots from freezing? Um, I would say that the stone has a minimal, because it does hold less of the root system than a container does. You could say a container holds, you know, everything except for the surface is inside of that insulated environment, it tends to hold a significant amount of the root system. This stone is really only in contact with a very bare minimum amount of the root system. And it's inside of that that there is susceptibility um, and where we wanna be careful, okay? So, so don't look at a stone as having the same capacity to protect and insulate as a ceramic vessel. They are, they are very, very different in their ability to do so. All right, question from Jeff. Is your knowledge of junipers only being able to move resources linearly or longitudinal, longitudinally versus pines being able to move resources laterally and longitudinally based in horticulture science? Or is it only known by experts in the bonsai community? Uh, that's, that's, a really, that's a really good question. Um, so this is based on, on vascular structure. Uh, so so I, I do have a degree in horticulture. That doesn't really mean anything in terms of being uh, knowledgeable about much. Um, but one thing that I did have to do is I had to take physiology. So I know what a tracheid, uh, I know what a sieve tube plate, and all of these elements that contribute to the formation of xylem. Okay, if you take that, there's a really beautiful book called The Body Language of Trees, which talks about the behaviors of, of trees at the crotches in the vascular tissue, et cetera, when they're put under stress. It's an out of print book, it's extremely expensive and it's the most dry reading ever. I, ref I reference it a lot. Okay, you can study that and you can start to understand how some of these things behave. But ultimately, when you look at why would a tree decrease its water conductive capacity through the xylem and replace it with a non-water conductive resin, 
You could say structural support, but it happens in short trees. So this is not something that physiologically is triggered by stress on a long lever arm. Instead, you look at what is the environment? What are the ways that a tree gets rid of toxicity or waste? And there is no mechanism to do so outside of shedding all the needles, which on a conifer it would die, or compartmentalization. And compartmentalization, when you see a young juniper, you have complete freedom of the live vein, right? Nobody will tell you that, and I wouldn't encourage you to explore it on a tree that you love. There was a moment in my apprenticeship where Mr. Kimura would give us these young junipers, and he would say, create dead wood on these junipers, 100% living tissue. And you would follow the linear uh, delineation of the bark. You would create dead wood on the side you thought was appropriate. He would come back, and he would critique you. They were pretty worthless junipers. I had one uh, fellow apprentice who completely spiraled the live vein around, but it was, a linear, it was a linear bark formation, right? The water moved this way, and he created this kind of living dead uh, relationship. And Mr. Kramer said, because this is a young juniper, it will live, but you cannot do this much past a five, 10-year-old juniper. And it lived, and it lived. Now, I've tried that five times on different ages of juniper. I've never gotten a juniper past 10 years of age to accept that kind of work. What does that tell you? that that young tree, that unfettered vascular conductivity has a malleable capacity, okay? If you look at the juniper stone planting that we did with the nursery stock whips, case in point, case in point, linear living tissue, wire causing the girdling and the deadwood to form in a spiraling formation and the juniper accommodated it with the additional growth forming a spiral as opposed to a linear nature, right? This is phenomenal. Sometimes in the native environment, especially in the dug firs of the Rocky Mountains and some of the ponderosas, linear central piece of deadwood, spiraling barber pole live vein. How does that happen? Exact same way. Constriction, girdling, changes in the environment that burn certain tissue while the tree is still young enough and malleable enough to redirect laterally as opposed to vertically. It does not last for forever. Why does it not last for forever? Tree's got to deposit toxicity somewhere. If you do, uh, 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 content analysis of that resin-filled heartwood, you will see all kinds of heavy, heavy metal accumulation proportional to the living tissue. That's another case in point. Physiological analysis is how I came to that. Nobody ever taught, nobody talks about this in the horticultural world because they don't care. And there's no reason for them to know that. We need to know it because we're dealing so intimately with the heartwood, with the deadwood, with the live vein, with the bending and mobility, with the necessity to understand tissue behavior, it makes bonsai very, very special physiologically to study these actions that enhance our ability to manipulate the tree. All right. Another question from Joshua. Do you view the thickness of the live vein at the base as the visual anchor for the semi-cascading design, or does the deadwood visually support the design? Um, deadwood... Deadwood is not a visual point of stability. And that is a super, super good question. The deadwood is, is, is really never going to form a point of visual stability. The living tissue is. The live vein occurring on the bottom, I think speaks to the reason that this tree fell over in terms of the story, right? It didn't grow out of a pocket this way. This is a tree that clearly collapsed. This is a tree that sort of lost its footing. That, that to me seems to be the story that is being told by this and the live vein being on the bottom side, not only is that authentic because ultraviolet rays would cook that live vein on the top side in the rocks uh, and stone that occurs in the Rocky Mountains at you know, seven, 8,000 feet of elevation. Um, but beyond that, the sandblasting, the desiccation that would occur would not allow this tree to survive unless the live vein were on the bottom and this thing had kind of collapsed on the rock. And this is a consistency. The most weathered portion of the tree is the top of this deadwood. The underside has virtually no texture. Again, another orientation specific reading of the environment through the material that allows us to continue to perpetuate that natural form. This is not a recreation of nature in miniature so much as an authentic creation of an actual juniper of this size in the native environment. And there, there are, and where I'm gonna get to with the formation of this apex and the scale and proportion up here, is there are moments where you want to create a small multiple apice form, and there are moments where you want to create a larger singular apical formation to, to, to generate that sense of scale that allows us to understand the, the imagery and the context of the composition that we're viewing and we're taking in and we're trying to interpret. 
All right. Here's a question from Andrew. If you have two small portions of shari on the opposite sides of the trunk of a juniper and you want to bend and compress, what's the best method? The two shari are relatively small, one to two inches. So I don't think splitting or separating it from the live vein is possible. Mm -hmm. But they're on both sides of the living tissue. So I would yeah. say much, much like when we start to look at where you have that central linear piece of living tissue, you've got shari on both sides. That's the situation we have here. I definitely want to bend into the deadwood, okay? I, 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 or away from the deadwood. I want to cause the deadwood to break and I want to let the living tissue bend as much as possible. If you try to bend, you know, you have deadwood on this side, living tissue on this side, and you try to bend into that deadwood, the deadwood is going to exert such a significant force out that the only thing that can happen is the live vein is going to break. So now if we start to say, okay, I'm going to bend and I'm going to, I'm going to tax I'm gonna tax that immobile system of the live vein and I'm gonna allow the deadwood to pop like we did here. That's the only way that you can take a, a central live vein and two pieces of shari and have success with that bend unless you wanna separate, right? Juniper deadwood can be hydrated. We can wrap it in a paper towel, a moist uh, towel. We can uh, soak it and saturate it in water and we can make that deadwood more malleable. This tree is soaking wet. It's been out in the rain for two days. We did the deadwood work today, it stayed wet the entire time. That's part of the reason that we had that success in control of that bend. I don't, I don't promote that a whole lot because it's an uncontrolled uh, aspect of bending. But in the Pacific Northwest, I will promise you that part of our success in the bending is the hydration over the fall and early winter that allows more mobility in the deadwood compared to the, the, the standard really bone dry, super rock hard deadwood that you would find in lower humidity, lower moisture areas. Okay, I'm moving into, I'm gonna go six gauge again here and now I've really started to kind of isolate these pockets of foliage and I have this branch right here and Lonnie, can you just, can you just kind of tune into this branch for a moment? I want, I want everybody to take a look at this because this is a really interesting shape of a branch. Notice that it comes up and then it kicks back right here, yeah. Okay, now the wind is blowing from this side in terms of our representation and we see this kick up and this, this is as natural as it gets in terms of a response. An upper branch, boom, and then coming this way. Right, so I wanna play on that. I don't wanna take that, I don't wanna lay it down. I wanna keep that branch up. You know, the wind hit it, boom, right? And that's the move, it came up, and now it's here. That's natural, that's the influence of wind as we see on the side that the wind contacts the tree. Right, we don't see this kind of lazy loop. You see, boom, it comes up and ugh, forms those angles. If you have it, keep it. If you have it, keep it. This is where we can domesticate a wild design and really spoil some of these natural nuances. Now, do I want control? Do I want to lower this? Do I want to change the plane and the field of it? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. This is why I'm wiring it. But beyond that, do I want to take any of that out? No, I don't. I want to preserve that as much as I possibly can and I want to drop this elevation down so that I create a hierarchy here. This is not my apex. This is not my apex. I define my line base to tip right here. This is my apical region. These pieces, these are gonna sit slightly lower and carry up over the top of that. Okay. Have to be very, very careful. Again, working on that dead live. Each piece, rotation, anchoring in the shoulder, offhand supporting my structural. Boom, 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 okay? All these things, ugh. Utmost importance in terms of accuracy, technical accuracy. One of the biggest things you can do in setting structure, proactively head off problems, okay? If, if you think, right, and, and every one of us has a, a, a bonsai fairy that sits on our shoulder as we're working. That bonsai fairy, it's giving you all of the, all of the guidance. It's saying, oh, that looks kind of risky. Should I do that? When you listen to it and you say, I probably not. I should probably, I probably should do this. I probably should take the harder route, even though it's going to take more time, you know, and, and it's going to be a lot more effort. Uh, I, I should do that. And you say, okay, and you do it and there's no, there's no breakage. And you wonder, you wonder, you say, would that have happened? Would I have had success? Did I really need to raffia that? Did I really need to hollow that and put the wire spine in? Did I really need to, 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 to go about it with that much care? And the next time you don't do it and it breaks, you'll never know. You'll never know. 
You'll never know if it would have broken the time before when you did all of that had you not done it. But if it didn't break, then what difference does it make, right? So to go through that effort, trust that bonsai fairy, even if you don't know anything about bonsai, the best chance of success in the execution of these things, design, technique, etc., the best chance of success is trusting your gut instinct. Trusting your gut instinct, that is your intuition. That's what makes each of us capable of doing things that the other can't. And bonsai is one of the clearest and most concise tests of your ability to trust your intuition. Because you are exchanging energy with this tree. There's no doubt about it. As I'm engaging with this tree, I'm taking away its photosynthetic mass. I'm manipulating its vascular flow, and it's telling me things. Okay, now it's not whispering in my ear. It's cracking a little bit. It's creaking. It's tearing. It's showing me where there's damage that's going to potentially cause issue. It's giving rise to opportunities when I take a closer look. This is the tree communicating. These are, these are, this is the voice of the tree speaking when it starts to subtly give rise to these notions, these ideas, right? That's taking in the, 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 the conversation of the tree, okay? Now, I'm taking off some of these pieces. These are, these are challenging pieces to take off because they are so incredibly interesting and the piece of material is so old. But I want, I want that space. And in particular, I want to see these types of branches that have dead wood along the, the exterior, small pieces of living, and these upper, unfettered, Deadwood lists, right? Completely living branches are covering these older aspects and these older pieces that, are, that are, are, are maintaining so much of the character. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna try to make those transitions and preserve some of those older pieces, okay? How are we doing on time? We are at 7.55. 7.55. Let's go ahead and do one more round of questions. I'm gonna wrap up some of these pieces on the apical region. And then this is a tree that we definitely are gonna to have to spend some time with in the workshop. But the majority, the bulk of the big decisions we will have made tonight, big, big opportunity and a wonderful thing, uh, wonderful tree to get to work on to celebrate uh, our continued wonderful relationship with the Rocky Mountain Bonsai Society and all the fantastic people there. What do you got for me? All right, so question from Leonard. Do the knuckles you reference, if left unchecked, turn into whorls? Yes. Yes, they turn into um, complete and total burls. And, and take a look, because this is a characteristic that comes with age, but it's a characteristic that you see throughout the structure of this tree. Notice this right here. That is a burl, right? That's a burl formation that occurred right there. Epicormic growth created that bulge, okay? These are burl formations where you see these big kind of balls forming, where you see these, this grain. Notice the, the, the confluence of movement that's happening through these pieces. This is where that irregularity getting caught right at that vascular junction causes all of that growth to sprout. If we prune all of that off and we strengthen the tip here, we can actually linearly override that confluence of grain. But this tree has a tremendous amount of burl activity, which is a significant sign of age and is, a, it is something that we have to deal with in the bonsai form if we're going to get strong, healthy tips and have the ability to generate the kind of energy on the extensions of the plant that give rise to a really wonderful shape and design. So it's something that we have to confront. A lot of times in the deadwood, it's a feature. In the foyer mass, it's a, it's a hindrance, and we've got to work through it. All right, question, another greenhouse question. When you, put the green, when you put the tree in the greenhouse this year, will you put any sawdust on it to keep from freezing? Uh, the greenhouse is kept just above freezing, so I won't have to do anything. It's a heated greenhouse. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we have species that can't tolerate freeze, um, which is tip typically why we go ahead and heat it. Um, yeah, so I don't have to put sawdust on the tree. Now, I would never want to put sawdust on the tree when we have the aggregate soil system of the bonsai container because we can get some of that organic kind of infiltrating those oxygen spaces and that can cause a real issue with health. Now, maybe you choose to set the tree in a healing in bed, uh, you know, kind of a mass coarse sawdust or, or mulch 
up around the edge of the container and you leave the top of that container exposed. That's a very standard and a very safe practice because we're not allowing organics into the oxygen spaces of our tree. But typically we do want to avoid putting any kind of organic content into the actual containerized environment. All right, question from Treebeard Steve. Given the explanation you gave for vein specific behavior, and it was informative, thanks. Mm -hmm. Should we expect a juniper in a moister environment to show less vein specific behavior? A juniper in a moister environment. Um, ultimately, if you sort of, if you look at where junipers grow, uh, they grow in arid environments in, the, in, in terms of native occurrences or even invasive occurrences. You, you know, you talk about the Western juniper it's not invasive, but they, they are trying to eradicate western juniper proliferating in eastern Oregon because it's a major water uh, consumer. If you talk about the grasslands of Texas and the ash juniper, they come out and they take uh, you know, chains attached to tracker, uh, tractors and they just mow down the junipers in that portion of the country because, um, because they're consuming so many resources and, and causing a lot of issue with grazing cattle. So there's, there's um, kind of a, a, a you know, uh, uh, a love-hate relationship with junipers. As bonsai practitioners, we, we, we absolutely love them. They're the backbone or one of the backbones of our coniferous practice inside of the art. Uh, when we look at it as, a, as an environmental, naturally occurring tree, a majority of the, a majority of the decision-making sort of Organizations that manage land uh, tend to frown upon junipers, and it's, and it's a real shame. But in a moisture condition, would it change their behavior? If you're cultivating them from a very young uh, state as a, as a bonsai subject, it might have a minor, if any, influence uh, on the way that they would behave. Now, if you look at the best domestically grown junipers, you're going to talk about the Taiwanese junipers grown in the fields of Taiwan. Uh, they produce that red heartwood very, very rapidly in a high, high, high relative humidity, but incredibly hot. Very hot. What does hot do? Hot causes them to transpire. Hot causes them to move a lot of water. What does that water do? It carries a lot of that toxicity. Again, aluminum is a big one. There are other toxic metals, depending on the soil. Where I come from in Colorado, it was filled, filled with iron to the degree that the soil was beet red. Uh, and when it snowed on it, it was one of the more beautiful things you could see. But for plant life, the junipers around were highly, highly contorted based on the poor soil quality, poor nutrient content of that soil, and that created a lot of the character. Okay, so now I think we start to finally see as we start to move that apex. Now I've pulled, right? And this branch right here is one of those thematics where we really kept that boom, boom, and we push that length out there. We're pushing the length out here. Notice how much this central area opened up and how much length we're getting out of that location right there. That's our longest point from that back branch. We will get delineation between the two, but you really start to see the wind moving through that tree now. That's kind of what we are after structurally. And we recognize, you have to recognize, and I said this in the beginning, structural setting is 90% of the scope of work. We have set the defining branch. We have done the major bends, and let me just show you the, the total rotation now that we've set that structure, okay? Because you're gonna see so much of a sort of closed in composition compared to the rangy disorganization that existed. And let me show you all the way here. You see how far forward. Again, that piece was out here. We've bent that all the way in there. That's a big, big bend, and I'm pulling on it right now because it's secured with a guy wire and I'm being very gentle. Typically, I wouldn't do that uh, if it didn't have those kinds of anchoring capacities. This could be like the Kusumono stream where I dumped it out on the table. Like if it broke just now, could you imagine after all the work we've done? I should be more careful, okay? But, but the next stage, the next stage, now that we've defined the line base to tip, we've set those, we've started to accomplish that influence, right? And again, we talked about, hey, listen, big kind of a small apex or maybe apex, apex, multiple apices showing a much bigger tree. No, this is a juniper growing out of a rock. This is a literal on the nose creation. This is the apex. 
This whole thing is the apex. Now it's gonna have organized compartments to the apex. It's gonna be organized in a way that improves its ability to tolerate the wind and not get sheared off by the sail effect. This is a nuance of the Rocky Mountains we wanna carry into this work. We've got the length generating that. We've got this back kind of wild piece sticking erratically up into the air. I've gotta open this up. I've gotta open up passages for the branching so that we see more of that negative space. Do I take away all the branches on that right side? No especially the ones lower down. Why the ones lower down? Because the ones lower down are gonna to start to experience the shelter of the stone. This is where we start to really get into the nuances, the nitty gritty of the native environment and all of the geological factors, the shading of a tree that changes the branching distribution, the stone or a neighboring plant that changes the wind shear effect and we have this normal behavior at this level and you know, two inches above it, it's getting sheared off, right? We can go to the utmost detail when we start to outline the native influences and factors that are acting on a tree and the fact that the container gives us that opportunity to really play on a literal. Maybe too on the nose, but I like it. I think it gives rise to all of the context. It also functionally has the weight to counter the movement of the juniper. I think it's a beautiful lead into what will become a very iconic tree. There are not many junipers like this in the world of bonsai. There certainly are none in a stone of this size and scale with a tree of this caliber. It is a very, very special piece from that perspective. All right, question from Greg. Can you clean the live vein on junipers at this time of year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good time to clean live veins, right? Intensity of the sun, the heat, etc., is gone. Right? One of the things that we had happen when that intense heat hit over the summer was that uh, 117 degrees, it wasn't the southern sun, it was the western sun at the very tail end of the day. If there was a clean live vein on a juniper and that sun hit it, it cooked it. If there was an exposed amount of, of branching or trunk on a ponderosa pine and that sun hit it, it cooked it. I've never seen sun do that to a tree before, but I am very humbled by the power of the sun. So when we look at shorter days, less intense sun as it drops down on the horizon, fall, spring, really, really good times to be cleaning live veins. Intensity of the middle of the summer, and we're gonna put that back out in that hot sun, probably not an ideal time to reduce the bark because again, the live vein and the living tissue of the trunk is transpiring. It's losing water, it's taking in oxygen through lenticels, lateral pores. So we wanna be sure that we don't take away that tree's defensive mechanism at those moments where it needs that protection the most or it is not adjusted and adapted to that reduction of that protection. This is a great time of year. Again, if we make a nick, if we damage it, vascular productivity, it will literally patch itself. The next day you'll have a hard time finding that nick on that tree. All right, next question's from Leonard. When you use the eight gauge to 10 progression, what if there are many branches to deal with? Do you put more than four wires on that branch or prune the number down? Yes, if you have, so I would never have more than three wires in any one junction on that branch, right? So I have my eight, I take my eight out to where it's functional, I then shift to 10. Um, but I don't want to have so many little branchlets that I've got four, five, six wires in a single junction, right? Where I've got those wires stacked. Three is the maximum. More than three means we probably have too many branches in that space that that piece is existing within and cleaning it will not only increase our ability to technically wire, it will also enhance the aesthetic and it will improve the horticulture or the, the design sustainability of the density of that branch and, and the branching that we're using to create the tree. All right, next question's from Kim. So are you saying linear movement is actually moving through the middle of the branch until the resin stops that flow? Um, so, yeah, this is a tough, this is a tough thing to understand. Um, junipers start out with the ability to move resources linearly up the trunk as well as laterally across the trunk. As the linear conductivity of water is carrying toxicity from the decomposing geology and soils that exist in the arid environments where these trees are. And again, there's little limited water, but there still is fungi and bacteria. Lichen would be one of the biggest actionable uh, organisms decomposing that rock, right? Just a slow, steady decomposition. 
and the decomposition in these organic tufts of soil with this leaf debris, that stone is breaking down through this biology and the, the breakdown is making resources available. Boom, taking, piggybacking on the water. It's present, there's limited water. Tree needs to cool itself. Doesn't matter how bad it tastes, right? You're dying out in the arid environments of the world, you're gonna drink that muddy, soupy stuff that might be water if it means drinking that or dying of dehydration. Now, are you, know, are you gonna die of, of giardia? or anything? You don't know, does it matter? The tree is like, I have aluminum, iron, copper, zinc, manganese, I don't care, give it to me. I gotta cool myself or I'm done. And once it gets in, it's like, oh gosh, I don't feel so good. You know, we vomit. What does the tree do? <sighs> Compartmentalizes it. Throughout the living tissue that exists inside of a tree, there are thousands of pitch pores. Now we think of sap, we think of sap as sap is a conductive, uh, uh, you know, viscous or quasi semi-viscous material, depending on how warm it is. Warmer it is, the more viscous viscosity it has, okay? So when we think about sap, we think, well, this is, this is something that's moving through the tree, carrying things. No, 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 no. Sap, Sap is a protective mechanism. Damage, boom, sap. What is sap doing? It's not sealing it. Sap is pushing out foreign pathogens, insects, boom, get in, sap, stop them, right? Oh my gosh, toxicity in the moisture, sap grabs it, right? And it takes it to the core of the tree. That's really where we start to see that action solidify in the central portion. Okay, and it solidifies in the central portion of the tree, holding that toxicity and making that toxicity unavailable. But the lateral movement of that sap, right? We have this big vessel, this big straw running vertically. We have small little pores running laterally. So that sap moves through that pore, clogs that pore as it's moving through that pore with that toxicity. Now guess what? That pore no longer has lateral. Well, you get enough toxicity moving through all of those laterals, those get clogged, guess what? Only direction moisture can go up and down. You now have vein specificity. You now have vein specific conductivity. When it's young, lateral, all good. Sap clo clogs all of those, psh, vertical or bust. Next question is from Bentley. When you're bending secondary and tertiary branches on a juniper, how long will it take for a branch to show that it's dying due to you bending it around too much? It depends. Okay, if we damage the water conductivity, if we break the xylem, then that branch will die within a week during the active growing season. Cooler temperatures, shorter daylight length right now, might take two weeks, might take three weeks. If we wait much longer and we get into the beginning of dormancy, it won't die till next spring. It'll stay hydrated the entire winter. If we break the cambium or the phloem, sugar conductivity, from the photosynthesis down to the vascular components, the roots primarily. If we break sugar conductivity, it will take 90 days for you to see the death of that branch. Depends on which tissue. You break the water conductivity, it's a rapid death. You break sugar starch or cambial conductivity, now all of a sudden you got 90 days for that to, uh, to uh, be shed by the tree. And question from Thomas, can you put a rubber pad on the live vein? Uh, when, and let me just go ahead and rotate around and I'll kind of show you how I handled this. Hey Zeus, you, you just want to show this, this particular piece right here. Yeah, so this is the rubber. This is what we use because that wire is such a focalized application of force. That rubber padding, I use gasket rubber from an automotive store. You can get it on, online as well. Um, and, I, and there's several different thicknesses. I have all of the thicknesses. This is very thin because it's a very small wire. Thicker wire, greater application of force, I'll use a thicker rubber pad. I do like to keep the rubber really small. A lot of people put this big oversized rubber on here. It looks like garbage. They use a big giant gauge of wire for their guy wire. Also looks like trash. Okay, keep it small. Keep it tight. Everything that you do here should be clean. Everything's executed with the highest level of technique. The aesthetic follows. All right, question from Elias. Could you ask if this juniper was growing out of solid rock? Uh, this juniper was growing out of not out, not, not like it was, it was growing in a depression in solid rock. So it almost had sort of a, a natural container or a natural pot, if you will. I doubt the rock looked like this rock, um, but I would be willing to bet that it was not far off. 
All right. And here's our last question. Is this in yours or Randy's private collection? <laughs> uh, this is one of mine. This is one of mine. Uh, you know, as a bonsai professional, I, I, I said as we were talking that going to a nursery and looking for nursery material is like one of my favorite things to do. The, the, there, is no, there is no piece of material that is beneath uh, somebody passionate about bonsai. Every single tree has an opportunity in it, has an opportunity. The most simple, the youngest, the oldest, the most audacious, every one of them has potential if you have an imagination, if you understand and you build your database of imagery and inspiration, etc. cetera. Uh, but trying to push myself, one thing that you have to recognize in the bonsai practice is you are pushed by the person teaching you and you are pushed by the quality of the material that you work with to continue to elevate the practice of bonsai, my practice of bonsai. I have to be challenged by the material from a simple imagination demanding way and a highly complex believing in the process, technical execution, and intense amount of environmental understanding to execute a vision. And this is the higher end of complex material that I can work with as a bonsai professional. We did a two-part juniper piece on a fantastic, phenomenal Rocky Mountain juniper earlier in, in, in 2021. That tree had a more traditional bonsai form. Super complex bending, super complex structural setting, really kind of gravitated in the more traditional form. This, this is a real Rocky Mountain juniper. This is a Rocky Mountain juniper acted on by the Rocky Mountains, the elements of those forces coming in and, and almost being removed and maintained in that environment as it sits in front of us today. How do you work with the two of those things? Techniques cross over in terms of similarities of approaches and the way that we view the tissue, the vascular behavior, et cetera. But aesthetics and the decisions of when we apply those techniques, how we apply those techniques to elicit the desired response is entirely different between these two trees. This is a grand comparison of traditional versus natural approaches to the representation that these trees have the capacity and power to convey, right? Uh, I, I think this piece of material has always, to me, felt like it was the next level of bonsai being an authentic representation. Uh, and I'm super excited that I had the chance to do this and not just to do this with you on the stream, but also to do this in collaboration with the Rocky Mountain Bonsai Society. Again, the motherland, my uh, place of origin in the Rocky Mountains, my place of inspiration, my understanding of what a tree was what conditions a tree has to exist in and the harsh, rugged nature that has really formed my desire to go study with Mr. Kimura, my desire to study horticulture, my desire to work with these native plants, my desire to embed myself in the landscape and further understand how that mass of land and elements influences the shape of the tree. The culmination of that, pieces like this that I think will break new ground in the world of bonsai. This is a no joke tree. You put this in any built space contextually represent this piece of work, it will be so powerful. And I think these kinds of trees are vehicles for change. I think they're vehicles for awareness. I think they're vehicles that illustrate our relationship with the native environment and the necessity for us to continue to preserve. Boom. Hey, thank you all. Everybody that tuned in on our social channels, very much appreciate you tuning in, spending your time with us this evening. Uh, check out live.bonesimeri.com, free trial. Take a look at what we have to offer. Join us, join us. Let's do this together. Bonsai is fun. There is much more accessible material. There's advanced stuff, there's inspiration, there's simple fundamentals. We will walk you through the process and make you better at Bonsai, I guarantee it. For everybody that's been a member, thank you for the continued support. You know that we love you. You know we appreciate you. You know we couldn't do this without you. The community continues to rage on and ride strong, and uh, it is an enjoyable pleasure to be a part of it. We'll continue doing what we do, and uh, we couldn't do it without you. Love you guys. Have a good rest of your night. Great rest of your week. Uh, we'll be here as your conduit. Love you guys.
Thanks for watching. If you want to be a part of our community and be the first to know about new product launches, see our latest work and get exclusive behind the scenes access to Mirai straight to your inbox, click the Mirai logo and subscribe to our newsletter.